Hi everyone, it's Brooke again, and today I'm going to give you a walkthrough of my mix of the Hesper Payne song, The Cruel Teeth of Winter. As usual, I've organised my session so I can keep track of everything while it's going on. Got greys up here for the various buses with delays and the mix bus. Red for the vocal groups, and then I leave buses within groups, grey usually, though not always. Guitars are blue, bass is this uh, magenta colour. Drums are green, and then synths and samples are purple. If we zoom out, I've got everything arranged as well vertically in terms of when it happens in the actual song too. Okay, so let's start with the drums. So the drums were recorded by a great session player called Glenn Wellman. You can find him on fiverr.com, and he's really affordable and is able to do some excellent drum tracks. I've I've never had to have him do any revisions for me because his stuff's always been fantastic when it's come through. And he records a live drum kit and it's recorded really nicely. So I didn't have to use any samples on this because we had a, a nice uh, drum sound already and I wanted to keep that because it, it really captured his performance. So we've got kick bus there and that's the sub kick and the kick drum snare top and bottom, hi-hat, which I didn't really use because there was enough of it in the overheads, toms grouped into a bus, and then we've got our uh, cymbals and room and drum reverb here. You can go on over to Glenn Wellman's channel and have a look at his drum kit and his recording setup to see how he, how he records things. I just get the files sent through to me after I've sent him the song. When I come to the, the do the mix, I've already committed the sounds I've made. So I'm not mixing and recording at the same time. I've got all my guitar tones mi uh, printed and set, my bass tones and my uh, drum tones and synth tones, everything's set. So all I'm having to do is, is mix anything, is mix everything. I'm not having to decide on the actual uh, tones that I'm going to use. I do that in the kind of writing and pre-production stage before I get to tracking. Sometimes I might change the tones after tracking if it, if what I've chosen hasn't worked out, but generally I try and commit early on. So it's another thing that I don't have to think about. And so when I'm doing mixing, I'm literally just doing mixing. And then I've already gain staged everything. So my levels are, are nice and nothing's really blowing out and, and clipping. And so the first thing I do with any mix is I get a nice balance on the faders. So that was pretty easy with these drums because they were nice, nicely recorded. So let's have a listen to them without anything on them. Okay, so this is just the, the raw drums. Obviously, the uh, most of that reverb there is coming. The reverb here is coming from a combination of Glenn's drum reverb that he prints a, a reverb track of, and then the reverb I've got on there as well. Okay, so let's have let's have a look at the kick. So here's the the kick sub microphone on its own. Probably not going to be able to hear much of that if you're listening on your phone or small earbuds. But it's definitely there and there's definitely some energy there. So first thing I'm doing is um, there wasn't really much going on in the upper and middle part there. So I didn't really need to do anything here. So what I'm doing is I'm cutting off the, the low lows cutting off at around 80 hertz and putting a bump there. So below 80 hertz is where I want the bass guitar to live. And uh, what I've done is I've used both the, the bandwidth on the low pass filter and the band filter here, just to give that a bump at around 80 hertz. And that gives the, the bass its kind of low end thump and, and power. And then I've, it was a bit woofy here, a bit, um, pillowy sounding, so I'd put a little bit of a dip there. So if you put that back in, it's 
like kind of like someone's hitting a, a, a pillow or a big cushion from a settee or a sofa. And I didn't want that, so that's out. Next thing we're doing is compressing it. Got a slowish attack on there, so that's letting through the transient. Use automatic release. Didn't need to boost it any. And that's just helping the transient come through, just so I've got that initial hit from it. That's all I did with that one. So next up, we've got the kick beater. That's been nicely gated, but there's still a bit of bleed in there. It's not, not too much. So first thing I've got on here was some R base there, just to give it a bit more thud and thump. And then we've got a gate on there. I put the R base on first, and my, my reasoning is because I don't want everything that the R base is adding, so I'm gonna. It's like I'm going to sculpt the, the combined tone of the kick and the R base after the fact. So the first thing I've got in here is a gate. And that's cleaning things up a bit. Especially on areas like this, parts where they've got the slow kick. It doesn't have to chop everything out. It just has to suppress it enough so that it isn't adding anything unwanted to, to the, the sound of the whole drum kit and the, the, the song. And this is just the stock reverb plugin, the stock reverb, the stock reaper plugin. And we've got some EQ. I've got this sort of loaf shaped <laughs> EQ there. So cutting off the low lows, taking out some of that woolly woofy frequency in there, taking out the high end, the extreme high end. So we don't really need anything. That's where the cymbals are going to live and other instruments are going to be up around there. And there wasn't anything useful for the kick drum in there. So that's all subtractive. And I tend to do use use my first EQ for subtract to subtract things and then a second EQ later on to, to add things in. And I tend to do it that way because it's just the way my brain works and I think it sounds good. So I'm, I'm doing things in, in set stages. So I've got a set process. So instead of just bouncing all around and getting lost, I'm following a set process so I can work things through, through, through a mix quickly and efficiently while the song is still fresh and um, I haven't got my, my judgment clouded. Next, we've got the stock Reaper compressor. And again, we're not really adding anything, we're just accentuating that attack getting the transient out of it and squishing down on the on the tail so we've got that sharp especially for these faster bits it's quite a slow song so i wanted to be able to control when when the kick was longer and when it wasn't and then the last thing on the bass uh, the kick drum is we've got the channel strip the waves e channel and i find that this just sounds nicer maybe it's a uh, it's snake oil but to me, it just sounds nicer when I boost with these kind of EQs. So I've got 9 dB at around 8K. You take that out. You can hear you lose some of that high end click. That helps it cut through the, the dense guitars and mix. And then I've got a wee bit of a boost at 80. And then we're not really using the compressor on there at all. So there's the 80, the uh, 8k boost, two kicks combined, and they're running through a bus and they've got JST clip on them, which is a soft clipper. And this just gives you more perceived volume. So it gives it more impact, but without uh, without sacrificing your transient. So it still feels like you've got like an actual impact happening from the, the kick beater hitting the head. So here it is in the context of the kit. We're also getting some of that kick as well from the overheads and the high end of the kick anyway, from the overheads and the room and the reverb. Here it is in context with the rest of the song. OK, 
Okay, cool. Next up, we've got the snare. So snare bottom, I thought it sounded okay. So I've got stock compressor, again, bringing out the transient and then boosting a little bit. So we've got some of the tail in there as well, but that's bringing up some of the bleed, but not too much. It's not too bad. So we can live with that auto release again, relatively slow attack. So we've got CLA-3A there just to kind of help control the transients that we're bringing out and then give it more uh, energy. And it, it kind of just sounds like that's making that louder. So when I was mixing this, firstly, I'm, I don't mix things in solo. I'm actually mixing them in the context of the song as well. So I can hear how they're interacting with other instruments. And I'm also trying to level match things so that I'm not just getting fooled by it being louder. So that's something for, to listen out for. And then we've got a snare top. So first thing there is gate. So we've got some more bleed on that snare top. It's really well gated and, and edited at Glenn's end. So we didn't really have to do much with it. Cleans it up really nicely. EQ again, getting the low end out of the way, but we don't want to lose this bit because there's some nice uh, energy here. A sort of low mid area gives your snare some weight and, and feeling like you know, you've got a bit of wood being hit by someone. Sounded a bit woolly and muddy here. A bit like a someone hitting a cardboard box with a mallet or a bowl of mashed potato with a wooden spoon. So get that out. That's all we're really doing at this stage. Attack to bring out, sorry, a compression to bring out the attack. Auto release again, not really boosting anything. And you can hear how that's really bringing out the attack of the snare. And that's starting to sound a bit weird, but again, when you mix it in context with the rest of the kit, especially the, the snare sound that we tone that's coming through the overheads and the, the room mics, it, it gives you a, a more of a rounded snare sound. So it's okay if things sound a bit weird in solo. Last thing we've got is the E-channel boosting a bit of 3k and then a bit at 300 hertz and not using the compression some more of that CLA 3a just doing a little bit there and we're not trying to do a huge amount with any one particular plugin. Think of it in terms of we're, we're getting lots of, we're using lots of thin layers of effect to bring out the details of the instrument rather than just plonking a load of one effect on and expecting it to do all the work. I found that this is, uh, some, some people might be able to do that, but I've never found it's worked. It's always better to get use like lots of thin coats to bring out the detail. JST clip again to give us more perceived volume and kind of uh, attack behind the snare. And then we're going to this to two verbs. We've got this cavernous verb sound because this is quite a slow, doomy, miserable song, so we can have that huge atmospheric verb on it. And then a smaller, regular drum room type verb as well. So this is the snares together. I love the sizzling crack that's coming off that snare bottom. And then here it is with the rest of the drums. And in context of the song. So let's have a look at the toms now. Uh, 
did a slightly different approach on the rack floor toms versus the rack toms, so I'll just do one of each because the, the principles apply well, rather than doing them all. So here we've got one, the high rack tom. Here's our EQ. Scooping out the low lows, that's where the bass lives. Scooping out this muddy, woofy area because that doesn't sound good. It's like someone hitting a cardboard box. There's a wee bit of a boost here, but that's really just to kind of bring this back up to gain. Because you can see the words have got this fundamental there. That's the, the nice tone that we want from the, the tom. And we're not really doing anything up in the high end. Sometimes I might cut up at the high end if there's a lot of noise in there, but I didn't really need to do that. These have also been really nicely edited by, to get rid of the bleed, by Glenn. Compression, auto-release, slow attack, bringing out the attack on the, the drums there, the transient, boosting a little bit so we get more of the tail of the sound, more of a fuller tone. And then the E-channel again, Boosting around 5k and then a little bit in the low end. So we'll get more of that uh, high end attack. Some of that low end. To put some of that fullness back into it. And that's pretty much the same thing on Rack Tom 2. Oh, here's a Floor Tom. This is the lowest floor tom. So first thing we do, same treatment we did for the rack tom, but we've moved everything a little bit further down because it's a lower tuning on this tom. And you can just hear you've got that sort of cushiony, pillowy sound there, like someone's hitting a, a sofa cushion. And it's kind of masking the, the tone we want out of the, the tom. Compression again, exactly the same thing, bringing out the attack, boosting some of the tail on it to get more fullness out of the, the drum tone. SSL channel, boosting it around 3k, 3.5k. Three, three And then a little bit in the low end as well to bring back some of that fullness. So it sounds like something big and weighty being hit by by someone with muscles, you know, like <laughs> like Glenn is. But there was a few annoying resonances. So I'm using the Fab Filter Pro Q3 with the dynamic EQ setting just to, to get rid of this area here that, that was really annoying. There was like a, an overtone that I didn't like. So if you boost that, you'll hear what it sounds like. A kind of um, 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 with, a, with a bit of a whistle tone to it as well. So just take that out. We're not completely killing it, just We've got it on the dynamic EQ, so it gets squished down when it pops up too much. Okay, so... The drums have go through CLA 3A. That's just giving them like a little bit of a squish, just to get some more energy and, and feeling of impact out of them. GST clip, again, more perceived volume and, and impact out of it. It's a soft clipper. So what I do with this is, you don't even need it full way, just have a quarter of the way up and then pull, use the trim to pull it back down to the kind of level it was at before, but it'll have more impact and energy to it. And then when there's a lot of toms going on, there can be more of that energy in this area that was getting a bit overpowering. So if we have them all playing at once. And 
and that just helps. It, it's not completely killing that, but it is just sort of calming it down, pushing it back through. There's a little bit of bleed still on there, but it's not too much. So I didn't bother going through and editing it out. And here's the toms in context with the rest of the drum kit. Again, we're getting more to tone from the toms from the overheads and uh, the rides as well, and the room mics. And in context with the rest of the song. And then they're just going to that regular verb. It's sort of like a large room verb. Didn't use the direct hi-hat, because there's plenty of it in the overheads in the room. And I didn't really use the ride and auxiliary microphone here. I just forgot to mute it, but it didn't, uh, it wasn't distracting, so that's no big deal. Okay, let's have a look at the overheads. First thing I'm doing, is I'm squishing and limiting them quite a lot. Sometimes I'll, this is just to, to sort of bring up the, the energy and the overall volume of it, of the, of the track. But also if you've got like a really aggressive snare drum going on in them, you can squash the snare drum right down with the, the limiter and that's so that you can process just the cymbals without having things like um, compressors getting triggered by the snare drum. Glenn's got quite controlled playing here, so we're not really picking it up in these overheads. So this is a pretty typical EQ curve for, for cymbals. We don't want anything in the low end, because this is where all of our low end instruments live. All our main actions up here, dipping out in the in the mids here, because that's where we get lots of woofy tones on the shells of the drums, and we don't want any of that getting in the cymbals. Taking out the extreme highs, because you can't really hear up here, and it's just kind of like white noise anywhere. The main things we're taking out here are these two notches. So if we pop this one up. You can see there's that noise. It sounds like something. It sounds like a pock, go pock, 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 or kind of sounds like sleigh bells to me. And it's an overtone that that really affects how it how it sound. And I find it really annoying. So I'm just dipping that out, not killing it completely, but pushing it back down to a manageable level. And the same for this one. There's like a really high pitched ringing. It's like a hissing, or like white noise, and again, not just not crushing it completely, just getting dipping it out so it doesn't affect the tone. And these are things you can hear more when you when you don't notice them while they're there, but once they're gone, you notice them. Got compression now, and that's really just there in case anything pokes out, and any surprise, big heavy hits. So it's not really doing anything at the moment, but if, if something jumps out, then that'll be there to, to catch it. And then our channel strip again, boosting it around 10K to bring out some of the, the shininess of the symbols and the detail. and then cutting some out at around 300 hertz. Because that sounded a bit trashy. I can't really explain it. It doesn't sound good to me, so that's gone. I'm not really using the compressor there as well. And then we've got the saturation here. And this is kind of helping shape the tone, bring up the volume and take out any excess harshness that I've missed with the EQ. And then I've got it up about 
quarter of the way around. It's quite easy to go too far on it, but that sounds about right to me. So here's the symbols in context with the rest of the kit. So on their own, they sound a bit thin and weedy, a little bit tinny, but with the rest of the kit, they fit right in quite nicely. And with the rest of the song, Have a look at the room mics now and I've put the volume right up because they're quite quiet before we start processing them just so you can hear them. So first thing we're doing is we've got these EQ curve similar before getting the low lows out getting the high highs out and then this woofy stuff in the middle we don't want to filter it as aggressively as we did with the uh, overheads. We still want some of these low end and some of the higher mids in there as well. So we've got the compression on there again, more as a safety net, and I'm using that to boost the volume a little bit, because as I said, this is quite quiet. We've got the v ch uh, E channel SSL again, boosting some at around 8K. around 200 gives it some of that low mid thump not really using the compressor too much down to its volume and then we're crushing it with the CLA 3 here to bring out that room sound and it's actually adding more than it, it sounds like to the drums I just have to have the uh, the volume overall volume much lower on the master bus because I'm using OBS and it maxes out really easily You can see when I take the room away, the room mics, the drum, the drums lose kind of they lose some energy and and size. Last part of the drum kit is the drum reverb track that Glenn recorded and I've got that rooted to the main drum track so it blends in with the other reverbs as well sorry the main drum reverb so that all blends together nicely so on the EQ taking out the low lows because you don't want a muddy reverb and taking out the high highs because we want the reverb to sit back and to sit behind the kit and put it in space and not be an upfront feature and again, just taming some of those woofy frequencies in the middle and then crushing it. Well, not really crushing it, but just giving it a bit of a squeeze with the CLA 3 ear. Needle's not really moving, but it is just giving it a very slight bit of compression and then boosting the volume again. So let's see that in context with the kit.
So the whole drum kit then goes through a drum bus and I've got this compressor limiter on it called Molot, which I don't really understand how it works, but it sounds cool. And I have it on the drum bus setting. And it's actually doing more than the needle shows on this one. It sounds quite good and it's quite easy to go over the top with it. So it doesn't look like the needle's moving that much, but just brings some more life to the whole drum kit, gives it some more attack and, and weight. We can see I've got this EQ as well, and that's automated. And what we're doing there is when we get to this section, I'm putting this aggressive filter over the whole kit to make it sit backwards while we've got this ambient quiet section. So that helps with the atmosphere of this section. So we still get the the drums, we can still hear them, we can still feel that they're propelling the song forward. But they're set back now because the spoken word and the atmospheres are, are the parts that we want to emphasize here. And we also want to create contrast for when the, the heavy part comes back in. And Having a filter like that does that really nicely. And you can use that kind of effect on all things. Like sometimes I'll put it on, I'll do a less aggressive filter on guitars, for example, in a verse. So when the chorus comes back in, the chorus feels like it has more weight and punch to it and life. Okay, let's have a look at the bass now. And that's glitching because I'm having to use the uh, the direct sound so I can record through OBS, the screen capture software. Bass is split into two channels. We've got the low end here. So here we've got this really aggressive filter, cutting off everything below 60 hertz and then a sharp slope down to about 500 hertz. These two controls here are taking out lots of woofy low end and and then we've got a little bit of boost using the, the bandwidth to to control that peak on the low pass filter so that's the, the dry di track the tone isn't as good as it could be because I was using old strings. But if you use new strings, you'll get a much better tone, especially if you want like a, a nice clanky, dangly bass tone. Next we've got the Waves L1. And then I'm crushing, pretty much just crushing this flat so it's not really moving at all. And then I can automate when I want any dynamic changes in it. Because this is metal and, and it's not like I'm doing pop music or like jazz or something where you need a dynamic bass guitar. This is just like a solid thick low end that's totally under my control. And you get a nice little bit of, from that gain reduction gives it a nice little bit of a crunchy feeling. And then this compressor is side-chained to the kick drum. That's what it's listening to. And that just gives the bass a little dip, pokes it out of the way when the kick drum happens so the two can coexist better. Some people can do it with, uh, do it with dynamic EQs, some people do it with um, 
multiband compressors. Some people can just do it with a static EQ, but I've never managed to get that to work, so this is what works for me. And then this is the, the distorted high end of the bass, which sounds really gross on its own, but we don't listen to it on its own. So that's the, the DI bass, and it's just a copy of the same DI bass. So we've got the BOD by TSE Audio, it's a free plugin. And it's emulating the Sans amp. And that gives us that nice uh, classic rock and metal high end bass tone. But it's still not quite dirty enough. So we're using the TSE Rat, another free pedal. This gives us, it's emulating a, a Proco Rat pedal. And that gives us some more of that nice. high-end overtones, some more crunchy dangliness, a clanky sound. And then aggressive filter again, so we're kind of matching, mirroring the filter that's over here. Getting, crossing over at about 500, getting rid of that, those mid areas where the meat of our guitars is going to live getting out of the way of the cymbals and the high-end stuff. A little boost around 2K just to bring it back up to, level, to volume and to give some more of that bite in so that the distorted bass track gels well with the distorted guitars. And that's what it sounds like together. Nice clanky bass tone, but with lots of solid low end. And in context with the rest of the song. All you really hear is the thick low end of, the, of this bass track. This track blends in with the distorted guitars and it kind of creates a unified distorted wall. And that's what provides a lot of the heaviness in, in metal productions. It's not the guitars per se, it's a combination of things. So if you take it away, you can tell that something's missing. tell something's missing when we take the whole bass away. Sounds like the mix is hollow. So that means our bass is fitting in and sitting there really nicely. And then you get bits like that where you use high end parts of the strings and the bass pops up. You could automate that out if you didn't like it but I thought it sounded cool. And that's what's important. It works with the song and sounds good. Okay, let's have a look at the guitars now. So guitars are DI into my Scarlet Solo interface. Uh, the guitars are Harley Benton Fan Fret 7 string. The DI signal. We'll just look at one of them because they're both the same. Hmm, heavy. And I'm using the Fortin Cali. So we've got the, which has the, the noise gate and the hex drive engaged. And it's mono with the, the high over sampling on. And it's just the default setting. There's the, the front panel. See what I can, to see how I've got things set up. I think I rolled back the treble a little bit and put, turned up the bass a little bit on this one. And then there's the mic configuration I've got. And I 
think on this one I have a slightly different yeah I've got more treble in this one just to give them a slightly different tone and then I've moved the microphones a little bit I think just to differentiate them a little bit something I regret on this was that I didn't have my headstock or the springs dampened on the guitar and you can really hear it on this riff I tried to edit it out as best I could after the fact but I really should have just dampened the strings and then replayed the parts you live and you learn and if you don't know what I'm talking about when I mean dampening the head strings the springs and the headstock uh, there'll be plenty of videos on YouTube that'll explain it okay so a reverb not really doing much on this at all. Uh, the Fortin Cal the Fortin stuff sounds um, neural DSP stuff sounds so good. Taking out the low lows, taking out the high highs. Just smoothing out the sound a little bit. Adding in a little bit of 8K just to give it a bit more bite. A little bit of 3K to give it some more bite. And that's it, not really using the, the anything else on the, the channel strip. This is quite important though. This is it, again using the, the FabFilter Pro Q3 Dynamic EQ. And without it, without this you can hear there's that low end kind of mm, mm. <laughs> noise and that's going to eat up a lot of headroom take up a lot of where you want the bass and low instruments to sit so we're getting rid of that but rather than just killing it completely using the dynamic EQ just to squish it when it pops up so this is a, a trick I picked up from the, the Sneep forum days and Andy Sneep does it with um, a C4 Compress multi-band compressor and it just kind of helps the chugs stay there it doesn't kill them completely it just brings them under control so you get that nice tight chug sound that we all like in this kind of metal and last thing I've got the guitars going to a bit of reverb just so that they're in the same space the last thing we've got is going sending the rhythm guitars to a reverb and that might shock some people because you're not you're not supposed to do that, but it sounded good. And if it was a super fast technical song like Arc Spire or something, it wouldn't be a very good idea because all your notes would get blurred, or rather, if you wanted like a really tight sound, maybe you want your notes to get blurred. But here we've got these slow chugging riffs and long drawn out notes, so we've got plenty of space for that to get in and it just gives the guitars more width and sets them back a little bit into the same kind of space that the rest of the instruments are in. So let's hear them in context. So you can't really hear the reverb. But you can feel something's missing when it's not there. Especially on those staccato riffs, the chugging. So next we've got the lead guitar. Uh, this was printed recorded a while ago and it was printed with a patch I made on Guitar Rig 5 and I can't remember what the patch is and I've lost it because I'm an idiot. But I really like the sound of it so like I said I'll quite often commit so even though it's already got effects on it that's the sound I wanted so I committed and I printed it but then the computer crashed and I lost the patch. But I still had the tone, so that's another reason why you should commit and print. So first thing we've got is this EQ. We don't want anything down here in the low end, and I just dipped out the was top the top end of it there just because it's not really a traditional lead, it's more of a it's carrying melody, but it's also adding texture and ambience. It, it needs to be 
heard enough so that you can make out the, the, the melody and get the emotional from it but it doesn't want to overtake the vocals because it's in the chorus next we've got the compressor and that's just squashing it down and then boosting it back up again to bring out some more of the the, the length of the notes and the, the ambience that's going on around them and then our SSL channel I'd recorded it originally as a stereo patch so I put the mono SSL channel to make it mono again bit of a boost at 8k dipped out some of these frequencies at about 4k sounded a bit scratchy and horrible so out of there and that just helps set it back beneath the rhythm guitars and the vocals and then a little bit of the the uh, compressor as well and I set it off to one side a little bit to the left in the stereo field so it balances out with the keyboards and effects that we've got going on on the right side. What have we got next? These dreamy clean guitars and I've got them here in this chuggy bit. And this is Tone Forge Mishaman Sewer and it was a one of the presets that came with it called Dreamy Clean. And that sounds really cool and again I've got this EQ to get rid of the low lows get rid of this here that sounded weird and I didn't like and then bring up the highs and that's all I'm doing all of the other effects on that just come from the plugin And we just want it peeping through, especially when the, in between the, the palm meat chugs. We've also got it here as well. And I've automated the panning and the volume on that. So it moves around and it's in different places at different volumes throughout the song to create dynamics and movement. And then our other clean track is this one. And that was the chorus clean in the Misha setting in the Misha Mansua GST plugin. Bringing out those upper mids and highs, getting rid of the 1k, because that didn't sound good. And getting rid of the low lows and the high highs, just to set it back a little bit. Just so those two things work together to bring out the atmosphere. The sort of the atmosphere. We've got this monologue going on here from my friend Steve Patton from Sea Bastard and Sebasius. He's an archaeologist, and he's talking about the harsh realities of living through the Ice Age winter. So we want this bleak, frosty sound to enhance that emotion. And then those, that's what those two guitar parts are for. They're there to enhance that. And that's the clean guitars. And then we've got some here at the end as well, just to kind of build up that this is like the end of the song, the last chorus. This is where it, it's all kicking off, so. So we're bringing in this melody line. The sense of a bleak isolation and desolation that must have been for early humans trying to live through winters that are way harsher than anything we could ever imagine during the Ice Age. So next up we've got samples and keyboards and these were played, so the keyboards were played by Alexandra 
also plays in Nemers. So you should go and check them out too. They're really cool. If you like um, earthy black metal, definitely check those out. And we've got a whole bunch of stuff. And not, we're not really doing much to them because Alex designed her sounds and, and played the parts so they would fit in with the things that were around them. So what have we got? We've got these this intro drums and these, these feedback. So this was just a drum, the original drum programming when I was tracking the song. And I applied a filter and distortion and a volume swell to it. And then the feedback is fake feedback I made with GST Sub Destroyer playing MIDI notes with through an amp sim. And I can't remember which one, but it's a, a really simple way to do it. And it just gives you this like haunting, haunting spooky intro like you're hearing distant sounds through the, the cold fog drifting across the, the frozen tundra so the other thing we've got here are these sleigh bells the jingly bells and these were played and recorded by alex all we've got on these is a bit of reverb they had these nasty resonances no do not like that and then this one up there it's just pretty much just all high-end information and that was the same for all of them and then we've got them going to a reverb just to give them some sense of space and that they're part of the same the same sonic world as the rest of the song So the, the jingle bells again were put in because we were releasing this song around Christmas time and it's a winter song, even though it's not a very jolly one. And so that's there to, to enhance that emotion, to bring that in. And we just also thought it'd be really cool to do. So we tried it out and it worked. And they're in different places or in the song, at different got them at different volume settings and panned in different places just to, to give it some movement here in the chorus. It also helps give a sense of movement. So this is something I've picked up from um, pop productions is you'll often have like a thing, something like a, a tambourine or an egg shaker or maracas in choruses or parts of the song where they want to, to create a lift to add a little bit more energy. So that's what we did here. And I'll often quite do it even in a really doomy song like this, just to give a part like a chorus or a special part, a feeling of, of movement, of more energy. So that's something you could try out in your own productions. And it doesn't matter if you're doing like doom metal, black metal, or death metal. It's if it if it works to enhance the emotion and, and impact of the song, then it works. It doesn't matter if it's not a metal instrument. So I thought that it was it was really sounded really good and it sounds really cool. What else have we got? So we've got some different keyboard sounds now. Um I'm not sure which instruments Alex used to do these, so I'll have to check with her and add it in. So I know she uses Absinthe and then I think something called Sample Tank that makes uh, emulations of things like B3 organs and other vintage type instruments. I think this one might have mostly been um, Absinthe though. So we've got this sound here. And that's adding low end and atmosphere beneath the verses. And you can hear when we take it away, it totally loses something. So what have we got on here then? Yeah, so we didn't want any of this low end. quite muddy, takes up a lot of information, and this is where we want the bass guitars and low end, and then I've boosted all of this upper mid stuff, from the upper mids upwards, so it cuts and, and, and fits in. Got a fab filter.
and again that's just to control these low end resonances because even though we used that other filter to bring them down there was still quite a lot of them there we didn't want to kill them completely so we're using this dynamic EQ to, to control them and then got to recomp here just to squish everything into place and then boost the overall level and, and help draw out the notes more, get more length on the notes. And then that's automated throughout the track, so it fits in properly. What have we got next? Next we've got this B3 sound in the chorus. In the pre-chorus rather. We're not really doing much to that, getting the load out of the way, sorting out a resonance and then boosting it in the in the upper parts where we've we've got very little energy. And that sounded okay. What's next? Hi Matar. And that's in the chorus. usual story, getting it out of the way of the low end, taming the woofy stuff in the lower mids, boosting in this upper mids and high end and then getting the high highs out of there. So we want to be able to hear this and feel it, well feel it more than hear it, in the chorus. So if we take it away the chorus you can hear it loses something and then we bring it in. And it really sort of adds to the atmosphere and emotion. Trying to create these mental images of, of the vast expanses of frozen wasteland that would have been the UK and Northern Europe during the Ice Age winters. And then we've got this sound here in the main riff called Leviathan. Again, all we did here is just got rid of the low lows. And that's kind of adding not so much note information as, as atmosphere and an underlying sense of, um, trying to create an underlying sense of dread and melancholy. So without it, something's missing but with it it just gives this section some some atmosphere and interest and again that's automated in terms of volume and then it's pan especially here in this spoken word bit so what else have we got so we've got these ghost hack samples and that's things like orchestral hits. And they're going to massive reverbs without any processing on them. There's a riser sound. Just to increase the tension towards the end of the spoken word section. And then we've got another impact sound. A brahm, and then those two played together sound like this. And I used repitch on that just to shift the pitch slightly so it was in key with the song. So they sound like this. My children must eat. Just adds a little bit of subtle drama to this spoken word part where Steve's talking about the bleak life of Ice Age humans. And then we've got our riser comes in here. And it 
again, these aren't effects that are there to be heard direct sounds. We want you to focus on Steve's spoken word. They're there to enhance the emotional voice saying, and make the next section really pop and explode. Next up, we've got the vocals, and there's a lot of them, and that's because I tend to have things separated out onto lots of different tracks. Sometimes I'll comp things down and commit them so I've got a stereo track with like a gang vocal or, or multiple doubles and things on it, but I didn't on this time. because so I was trying to, I, would, I didn't have ideal recording circumstances because I was just in my bedroom because of the lockdown. So I had everything separated out. I won't go through all of these, but I'll just show you what I've done, which is pretty much the same, the same on all of them to different degrees. So here's got the main vocal. Numb, stumped, trudging onward. So firstly, I've got retune, just on automatic, because I'm a rubbish singer. Empty belly grinds within. And got some EQ. Getting rid of the low lows. Keeping some of this around the, the lower mids, because that's where the, the warmth of the voice is. Got rid of this, the, this part here, which made it sound like a, a cheap telephone. And then got rid of the high highs here. Squishing it down 6 to 7 dB, boosting it a little bit as well. Medium slow attack, auto release. Numb, stumped, trudging onwards. So the trying to bring out the kind of attack of the vocals, make them sound more to bring out the energy and emotion in them. I couldn't be as aggressive with them as I wanted to in recording, because my neighbours complain. <laughs> Don't want to frighten the little old lady upstairs. So until I can get to a studio or space where I can be loud, I'm going to have to do vocals like this while we're in lockdown. And the compression, having the compression set like this really helps to counterbalance the, the fact that I'm not able to be as loud. Although on the, the plus side, I'm having to think about things and enunciate them more and, and bring more emotion through my voice without having to just be loud and growly. So... It's definitely been an interesting way to record vocals. One foot Using the low pass filter on the SSLE channel, boosting some at 8K. Hard upon the frozen That's not a thing I just do all the time. It just happens to be the way things have worked out on this song where I've had to add a lot of 8K on various things. Adding a bit at 4K just to help it poke through because I've ducked this down in various instruments. So I've got somewhere the vocals can poke through. Getting rid of some of that woofy low end, low mid stuff. Makes things sound a bit woolly. And then a little accidental boost there little bit of the compression and I've got that set as the last in the chain on the channel strip. Waves CLA 76 Blueface using the Rock My Vocal setting because it sounded cool. Nothing wrong with using presets if they sound good and work. Again to lock the vocal in place and then bring out more of the aggression that I couldn't put in. You can hear the retune glitching there on my crappy singing, but that's okay. It kind of blends in with the music. And then Deessa. I've got lots of bare walls in my room, and so I'm having more problems with this than usual. And in the mind. But that's what I've got to do to get to make music at the moment. So I'll have to live with it for now. It's uh, it's better to be making music, even if it's not as good as you want it to be, 
than it is just to sit and wait because the more you do then the more you learn and the better you get faster and then we've got that going to a delay and that is a short delay here and that's just h delay with this setup Spear. One, One foot, foot after, after another, another. hard upon the frozen drums, numb stumps. Cool. And that's pretty much the same way I mixed all of the all of the vocals. I'll just look show you the, the differences. So in this pre-chorus vocal, I use a little altar boy to give it this spooky, cold, crystalline effect. And I've also put some saturation on it. And on the chorus bus, I've got Decapitator. with this old radio voice distortion. Just to help it blend with the heavy guitars more and a little bit of aggression and texture. I'm also simultaneously putting the chorus vocal to a long and short delay, to a separate long and a separate short delay, just to give it more of a, an epic feel because we're in the chorus now so things need to be really big and opened up. So that's everything for the vocals. Uh, let's have a quick look at this. Yeah, so for background vocals I EQ them, take off a lot more top and a lot more lower end as well just so I can get them to to sit back. So this is Steve's vocal as well. We had a lot of issues with Steve's vocal because it, it wasn't recorded in, like mine, it wasn't recorded in ideal circumstances. So I had to do this, this weird EQ curve to get it to fit. And that's comped together from several takes that I edited. So again, it was a really good performance. So while, yeah, so while it wasn't technically perfect, it was still, they were still really good performances and they really captured the emotion of the, of the song. And that's really more important than if it's technically good. Although ideally you'd have it technically good and uh, emotive performance. Okay, cool beans. So these are the various reverbs I've got on the, the verb that the drums go to is this uh, soft tube SAR1 reverb. And that sounds like this. That's good guitar's going to as well. It's like a hall setting. And that just helps to put everything in the same space. There's our short reverb, H delay. So the vocals go in before the effects chain. So you can still really hear how bad my singing is. But it gets the job done. Here's the long delay. Also use the filters on the on the delay to take out the highs and the lows so the, the delay, like the reverb, sits back more. And this is the cavern effect that's for the, the cinematic impacts in the middle section. And that's a H delay with those settings going into a ZAR1 with those settings. And that's, and I use the send controls to set the volumes and then just leave that at zero. I've also got this on the main reverb, I've got this EQ.
So that's all of the, the separate instruments and, and instrument groups. Everything goes down to a mix bus. Well, I didn't have anything on the mix bus this time and then into the master bus. So the first thing I've got on there, I'll take all of these off. First thing I've got on there is an SSL bus compressor. And that's just doing a tiny little bit of compression. We're just getting a little bit of a nudge on the needle. Just to sort of push things back down when you get those big tom rolls and the, the big snare hits. Then we've got this fab filter, Pro Q. Just doing a low cut on there. Can't remember I've got that one turned off. And then this is a little experiment with mid side. So here I'm doing a bit of an experiment on the master bus with the uh, Fab Filter Pro Q3's mid side functions. Normally I would get my pal Solius to master these for me, but I didn't really have time for this on this one. So I'm having a little bit of a go myself. And I tend to I prefer to have someone else do it because Solius is really good and knows what he's doing. And having someone else does it restores objectivity because by this point my objectivity is completely gone. So it's hearing it with fresh ears. So what we're doing now is we're putting all of the low end through the middle channel. We're cutting the low end out of the sides and using the dynamic EQ to do that. And then using the dynamic EQ to boost the low end in the middle. And then we're taking some of the upper mids and lowering them in the middle of the spectrum and then boosting them at the sides. There's it off. And there's on. It's quite a subtle effect, but if you listen carefully, you can hear that it focuses the, the low end down the middle, and then we get a nice lift on the edges. And lastly, we've got L1, just to bring us up to volume. So there we go, that's how I mixed Hesper Payne's Cruel Teeth of Winter and also did a, a half-baked mastering job on it. I hope you found that useful. Let me know if there's any if you've picked up any new tricks from that, or if there's anything you'd like me to talk about in detail about the, the tracking or mixing of this song. You can check this song out on Spotify and Bandcamp at Hesper Payne, and I'll be doing more mixing tutorials in the future, so subscribe so you can get, take advantage of those. I've also put the multi-track files for this in a link below, so if you want to download it and have a go of them, of mixing it yourself, then you can do that. Until next time, see you later. Bye.